Today we're going to be learning about chapter two. So this is kind of part two of the introduction of to accounting. Um, so now that we've learned the aspects and what accounting is per se and what are the different areas that you could do with accounting, now we're actually going to be introducing to what accounting essentially does, especially in financial accounting. So again, here is that in that uh, um, uh, definition of what accounting is. It is basically the process of recording, sorting, analyzing, um, summarizing data from all business transactions. So again, anything that has to do with a business transaction. All right. A um, few things that I want to also um, have you guys recognize is is going to be um, that there is a slight terminology that you guys should learn. So it's if you guys can learn English, right, you're going to also have to learn the language of accounting. So um, I put a few examples here on the little right side. So um, to receive something, so whether it's cash or something like that, it's called a receivable, right? To pay something, is it going to be ex actually? No, that's wrong. Uh, but because um, how I use expenses, you're spending something. Expense. Uh, to owe something is a payable, right? If you're going to owe money, then that becomes a payable. Um, if you own property, that becomes an asset. Okay, and any obligations is going to be a liability. So these are basically um, just underlining the real terminology as far as understanding the five main account types. And we'll talk about that in um, a few minutes. But these are just similar terminologies that oftentimes like uh, when we look at a scenario, this is how you break down and you sort out your um, information. So we'll look into a couple examples um, um, in chapter three, okay? So um, another thing is there are uh, different many aspects, okay? And we are focusing on financials. So um, again, uh, I talked about this in the first chapter. Um, so we're, all our main purpose is recording journalizing and um, creating our financial statements. So, um, yes, we're not going to be learning about tax. We're not going to be learning about cost um, cost accounting. And definitely we're not going to be investigating um, uh, a company. All right. So what are accounts? Okay. In accounting, there are five account types okay you have your assets you have your liabilities your equity your revenues and your expenses okay um so um so accounts are a, a systematic uh systematic way to keep um all your records organized um by um you know by sorting out your data right so how we sort out our data is we're going to first recognize, well, what is the item? And when we look at that, we're going to, we're going to separate them based on account type. So um, I'm going to give you a little brief of each one. Assets are anything that you own, anything that you have, anything that you purchase and that is actually physically yours. So cash is obviously going to be yours it's not going to be someone else's um anything that you own as property is going to be an asset liabilities are going to be anything that you owe whether you owe someone else you have a loan right the loan is yours but you owe people money to pay back so in a in a sense liabilities are just in general terms um, it's just things that you owe to other people, okay? Equity. Equity will be the value of your company, right? It's going to ultimately um, be... Um, 
Some people refer your equity as your original investment. Yes, it is your original investment. However, at the end of each period, which we'll talk about, at the end of each period, you're going to have to reevaluate your company um, to either um, either withstand, uh, to maintain, or just to show that your company is worth money. Okay, so that is what equity is. Um, and these three accounts right here are called permanent accounts. These ca accounts never close at the end of the period. Okay, they are always open. All right, and we'll talk about reasons why this concept holds true. Okay. And then we're going to go ahead and look at the other two um, types of um, accounts, which are your revenues and your expenses. Okay, so revenues is pretty straightforward. It's the purpose of why you have a business, right? Revenues are any type of income that you collect. Um, also, revenues is also referred as income. So um, it could be income or revenues, whatever you want to use it, it's interchangeable. Revenues, though, um, entail every single source of income, us, every source of money that comes into your, um, into your company. So that entails sales, right? Maybe you have some shares from, a, from another company, right? That's considered a type of income, right? Maybe you bought a bond from the bank, right? And you're collecting interest income from there. So but that's an example, um, but that is ex essentially what um, the revenues are. And then lastly, expenses is pretty straightforward. Expenses entail um, anything that it takes to operate your um, business. So spending, that's why um, I do refer um, expenses as something you spend, right? You don't, it's not something that you pay per se, but it's something that you make a spend, you spend it for the reason of business purposes. And these two um, accounts um, close at the end of the period. Reason being is because if you look at it at a standpoint where if you are um, a regular shop, right, you will never incur the same exact sale by month to month basis or whenever your period ends, right? So if we look at it at a day to day basis, right, your sales will never be exactly the same. Yes, you can have a customer, this the uh, uh, what do you call it, a regular customer, come into your shop and order the same thing, but that person can always order something else, something different today. So that so that's an assumption. And then same thing for your expenses. You're not going to pay for advertising expense for every single period, right? If we're doing, looking at a day-to-day -day, um, um, aspect, you're not going to charge. Um, you're not going to charge advertising expense every day. You're not going to have um, a, a license um, um, expense every day. You're not going to have labor expense every day. So, so this is exactly why we close out revenues and expenses because even though you're not going to get something every day or that's the same, we close them out because that is an actual perfect measurement of how your company can progress, right? So if today my sales weren't great, tomorrow my sales get better, the next day my sales have skyrocket. That right there is a perfect measurement of how profitable my company is and how progressive my, uh, like, I mean, not progressive, but how um, my company has progressed. So um, that is why they close it at the end of the period, because then if you could start from zero, that is a better, um, that is a better measurement to start off from ground zero and measure to when you um, 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 stop. Okay. So, um, yes, so we're going to go into each um, account type and we're going to look at um, the details beyond them. All right. And oh, I'm sorry, the revenues and the um, expenses, we call those temporary accounts. OK, 
Um, I don't know if your book talks about it, but I know for QuickBooks, they do refer your permanent accounts and your temporary accounts as um, they actually separate them, okay? So first thing that we're going to be learning is going to be about our assets. Okay, so remember, ass oh, oh wait, actually, oops, sorry. One page back. So how we structure out how we organize our information is we have what's called main accounts, sub accounts, contra accounts, X, Y, Z. All right. Now a main account. Lynn, yes. Sorry. Um, can you just click on the got it on your screen? So it goes off your, you have a, there's like a box that's in front of the screen that you're sharing. Okay. I thought it was just me. Uh, okay. Cause, cause I don't see that. Got it. <laughs> and it was saying something about you sharing and it's always like right in front of the slide that you're showing and it just said like all you had to do was click got it, it said. oh okay do you see it do you guys see it now is it still there it's gone now no. okay yeah. all right thank you because it just had the, it had the screen frozen all right <laughs> did you it, so it was it was in the right corner right bottom right it was on the left the middle a while ago. yeah oh Okay, okay, because I did not see that at all on my screen. So, okay, thank you. All right, all right, so, uh, yes, now we're going to go back to accounts, accounts. So, how um, accounts are organized, right? Um, so, this also goes also in line with um, the accounting model, which we'll talk about in um, a few more slides down. So, when we organize our accounts, right, we kind of have like um, like a table of contents, right? You have the main chapter title at the very top, and underneath it is going to have subtitles or subsections or um, I guess, yeah, I guess subtitles, right? So this functions exactly the same, except there is only a couple, there is only one difference, all right, so one difference is when we are creating our sub accounts or our subtitles, we have the possibility we have the um, possibility of also creating a contra account. Now, the main account, right, the bit, the the overall chapter, is going to basically be a very broad, generic type of account. It's like an umbrella organization, right? It kind of sums up what each, uh, I guess it basically sums up what the uh, account is. And it usually has some type of flow as far as um, credit, debits and credits go. And we'll talk about that in um, when, we, when we get to the um, normal balances. So the main account flows in one direction, right? It pays, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a broad title, okay? And as we um, create sub accounts, basically what the sub accounts is, it, it gives more detail to the main account. So again, for example, chapter, chapter one, right? Chapter one could be the introduction to accounting, but when you go break it down, it's going to have things like, what is accounting? What are the aspects of accounting? What are the areas of accounting? What type of business activities, right? So it's, it's so what um, essentially a sub account does is it just gives more detail to the main account and they typically flow in the same direction. And it will make sense when I talk about um, the accounting model. So again, for example, right, we have cash here and we have accounts receivable. Now, how I segregate it is, um, or separate it is going to be, I have my main accounts to be all capitalized. And then my, my, my sub accounts are going to be either um, um, lower, uh, lower upper, upper and lower case, or they're just going to be indented. Now, what a contra account does is, essentially it does break down or it actually 
um, gives more details to a sub account. However, the only difference about the um, sub, but about the contra account is it flows in the opposite direction. Meaning, if my cash flows in the debit side, then the equal and opposite would be the credit side. So that's what a contra account does. All right. So for example, here if we look um, on the other side, so my account's receivable, right? It's me receiving money. My contra account is called the allowance for doubtful accounts. What that essentially does is it decreases my accounts receivable. All right. And then again, we're looking at uh, the difference between a main account and a sub account is my first example is, uh, I mean, my second example is I have inventory. Inventory is the main account. But inventory is so broad. If you're a company and you just say, I just put everything in inventory, uh, I mean, you also want to be specific because you want to keep track of, like, the specific item. So we break it down into a sub-account and we create that I have coffee mugs and it's considered inventory, but it's a specific type of inventory. All right? Next is obviously going to be, well, what is left and what is right, okay? So, again, um, left will always mean debit. Credit will always mean right. So, I flipped and reversed that. Left will always mean debit. Right will always mean credit, okay? And this is, I mean, for my past experience of um, doing accounting I've never been referred as left and right I've always been referred as debit and credit so um but this is this goes along with how you look at your journal you generally would debit on the left side and you would generally debit um I mean credit on the right side so this is more appearance kind of thing but if I were to talk to you um about um I'll put it on the left side it just means to put it on the debit side. Again, um, I don't use it as that kind of way. But just know that left means debit, right means credit. Okay? Now, again, uh, be careful when referring debits and credits, especially when you refer them as increase or decrease. Because when we look into the accounting model, you're going to see that Debit can mean both increase and decrease. It just depends on what um, account type you're dealing with. And same thing with credit. Credit can function as both um, um, increase or decrease. So never refer debits and credits as an increase or a decrease, okay? Because it just depends on what account you're looking at. And I'll give a, it will make a lot more sense when we uh, keep going further, all right? And then here's the famous, famous, famous um, accounting equation that must hold true wherever you go. So your total assets must equal your total liabilities plus your equity, okay? So no matter how um, you record or do your transactions, this equation must hold 100% true. And if for any reason that your assets are more than what you owe and what you own, then your accounting, you, you, ha you have a mistake or a discrepancy in your accounting. So um, it's very important that you test this formula um, every single time you, um, every single time you either, um, when you're done journalizing or when you're done um uh, recording your transactions it is it is it is highly recommended that you test this formula every once in a while especially uh, when we look into um, doing our um, trial balance and it, I mean not trial balance balance sheet because again the balance sheet again it's going to hold it's going to test the assets equal liabilities and equity okay so you, this ensures the accuracy of your accounting, all right? So now we're going to get into assets, liabilities, and equity. We're going to be looking into um, each um, account type 
and what each one has as far as categories. All right. So assets, okay, again, are everything that you own or anything that you, that, that you have property to, okay, that you have ownership to. Okay, so how typically assets are organized is they are organized based on how... Um, how easily it could be converted into cash. Um, um, and we, I guess we call that liquidity. So um, we, when, you, when you start journalizing your accounts or if you look at a chart of accounts, it's going to be in order based on how easy cash can be uh, converted into. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about each category. So there are three categories when you're dealing with assets. You have, a current, you have current assets, you have fixed assets, and you have other assets, okay? So under current assets, right, it's going to typically be anything that can be readily, uh, readily converted into cash. Um, usually um, the timeline is within a year. Um, so again, cash is, is obviously going to be at the very top because it's already in its, um, it's already in its cash form, right? And then we have accounts receivable, right? Accounts receivable are money that people owe. Now, if you think about it as an IOU, you can easily go and collect that money. Now, for the customer standpoint, if they're willing to pay the money is the, is the question, but accounts receivable is in, in another sense of a form of money, okay? It's an IOU. So technically, it is a form of cash. It's just you don't have it right now. You have to go and collect it. Um, and other things like inventory, right? Inventory, you purchase the inventory, you sell it right back, and it gets converted into cash. Simple as that, all right? Now we're going to talk about the second category, which is fixed um, assets. It's also known as PP&E, which is property, plants, and equipment. So if you understand fixed asset as property, um, property, plants, and equipment, then this is going to be the easiest way to categorize your assets, right? It's anything that has a lifespan of more than a year, okay? So again, the first one, less than a year. Second one, more than a year. However, the difference between um, um, a current asset and a fixed asset is typically when you buy equipment, right? If you use it, can, um, it is not very easy to sell back to the market. And you're more likely to sell it at a lower price. Even if you bought a brand spanking new machine, you never opened the box and you never touched it, it's definitely going to lose its value over time. So, um, but it does serve the purpose of producing or help you your business operate, right? If that's what equipment is, generally it helps um, run your business, right? It could be machinery, it could be furniture. All of those, right? The minute you buy it, it's not very easily to convert back into cash. Now, of course, if... If, it's, if you have that whole return policy, then yes, it's easily to be converted. But what we're saying is if you buy it and then use it, then you're, it's, it's hard to convert back into cash without short selling it. So typical things that you would see in um, a fixed asset. So again, I talked about property. Property, meaning your land, okay? Meaning the parking lots, meaning um, the location that you're in, the area that you are in. That is typically going to be your property. Your plant. Your plant's going to be your building, your facility, your warehouse, okay? Um, and then equipment can entail anything such as furniture, um, your equipment such as machines to run your business. Um, it could also be... Um, but those are typically that you would normally see um, as far as it, um, the um, fixed assets, okay? So anything that you own that is considered um, property, plant, or equipment is going to be considered as a fixed asset, all right? 
Now we are going to talk about the third one, which is other assets. Other assets are pretty much anything that doesn't fall into the category of a current asset or a um, um, fixed asset. So usually um, what we normally use the other assets are is going to be um, things that have a, um, a uh, that's supposed to be indefinite life or things that you have um, or intellectual property. So intangible assets would definitely fall under the lines of other assets. Why? It's not a physical item. Second of all, it's, um, its life can be a really short one or it could have a very long one. We don't know, but it is determined already. However, um, it doesn't serve as equipment. It doesn't serve as your proper, as a, um, like your land. It doesn't serve, so it doesn't fit under a fixed asset. And definitely, you can't sell it. Uh, you can't sell intellectual property like in, in an instant. So it's definitely not going to be um, a current or a fixed asset. So we just categorize it as a, as other, okay? So again, um, any intellectual property such as copyrights, um, licenses, um, permits, um, as well as... Um, um, uh, let me see, we have copyrights, um, anything that shows ownership, but it's, it's, it's legal, I guess, um, it's, it's, I don't know how to describe it, but an intangible asset, right, usually you would buy it, right, and it has some kind of intangible thing, like, if you have a copyright, right, how can you measure a copyright, you can't, it's just, um, a formal, not a formal, but it's just an invisible protection again uh, for your property. Okay, so um, usually it you're you're given a piece of paper, but a piece of paper you can rip that up, but the um, property, the copyright's gonna stay um, in contact or intact. Sorry. Um, other things that you would see is like deposits, like rent deposits, right? Rent deposit would not fit in any of the categories as far as current assets or a fixed asset, right? It serves as, as, a, as a point for you to hold on to. It's just like a, a stashed away money, essentially. So deposits or any prepaid accounts, right? Next, we're going to go into liabilities. So again, liabilities is anything that you owe to people, Okay. And it's separated between two categories. You got current asset. I, I'm sorry. You have current liabilities and you have long-term liabilities. Okay. Um, so usually how they're organized or measured is based on how long you owe them for. So um, a current asset, right? It's if you owe anything that's less than a year. Um, so typical example would be accounts payable, right? If you owe a vendor money because you purchased items from them, typically they'll give you 30 days to pay. So that is definitely less than one year, all right? Sales tax payable, right? If you're collecting tax from um, your customers, guaranteed you definitely don't have a year to pay that back to the government. You have, it can, that can vary, and we'll talk about that when we go into um, inventory. But it will def you would definitely, definitely see that you need to pay that government within a month or two, okay? They're not going to let you hold on to money that is actually you're supposed to collect for them. Um, other things could be uh, notes payable. Now, I'll talk about notes payable in a second. Um, but other than that, uh, long-term liabilities or anything that you owe uh, for more than a year. So typical ones would be loans, right? Loans can go anywhere from one year to five years, 10 years, 36 years, right? I know that homes are for 36 years. Car payments could be anywhere from five to seven years. Um, you know, business loans, um, student loans even, right? All of those things, typically they, like, they make you pay after a year, okay? Or they make you, they have a long extended period on when you can pay back. And usually that will determine whether it's a, a current or a long term. So oftentimes um, the um, 
uh, most common one you would see would just be a, a typical loan. Now, a notes payable. What a notes payable is, is basically a formal, um, a formal IOU. It's where you are in talks with a person and they either they owe, you owe them money or they owe you money. In this case, my notes payable is I owe them money, right? So if I'm owing them money, right, there is no legal con contract that bounds me to pay them within a year, right? We can always renegotiate. And with that flexibility, that makes notes payable of um, both either or a current uh, liability or a long-term liability. So I've seen notes payable that for six months, I've seen notes payable that are three years. So uh, notes payable, okay, you can categorize it depending on how the length is it. Is it something that you're paying back immediately? Then yes, put it as a current. If it's something that you're not paying right away, then put it under a long term. Okay, so that's the only um, example that I can think of that can that is flexible as far as a current and long term liability. Now, one number one rule, number one thing is never refer your liabilities as debt. Okay, because technically, yes, they're they're debt, but in accounting, we don't use the word debt to refer to liabilities. We uh, we call our liabilities as obligations, right? It's obligations that we have to pay. It is not debt that we are collecting. It's not debt that we owe. That That's going to be used as regular English, all right? But in accounting, we refer liabilities as obligations, okay? And then lastly, let me see if we're... Uh, and then, okay, so not lastly, because there's still two more accounts I need to talk about, but we're going to be looking into equity, all right? Now, oftentimes, um, you will get confused, especially if you're looking at this at a corporate standpoint level, because when you're looking at equity, right, is the value of your company, and usually your value of company entails both income and revenue, I mean, sorry, income and expenses, um, now what, when, um, I learned corporate style of, um, stockholders equity, it basically was your revenues plus, uh, plus, um, no, it's your revenues plus your, uh, you know, it's retained earnings, which is going to be your revenues minus your, um, expenses minus any dividends. Okay. But this does not hold true when it comes to um, your um, when it comes to smaller businesses. It's actually going to be your revenues minus expenses plus an addition of whether you have um, a cop a capital contribution or um, whether you have a um, a um, withdrawal. Okay, and I'll talk about that in a second. Now, what equity does do is it. Um, it's, again, it's the value of your company. Capital contributions mean if you invest more money into it, then it's going to increase the value of your company. If you do an owner's withdrawal, which you take money away from your company, then, you know, it's straightforward. You're going to lose, you're going to, your, the value of the company should be a lot less. And those are typically what you would normally see when you're dealing with equity. Now, Equity does not have any categories, okay? So again, equity does not have any categories, but these are things that contribute to um, equity, okay? And um, so that's why I said usually it, it's your capital expenditure, I mean, sorry, capital contributions, um, your owner's withdrawal, and then it's your Revenues minus your expenses, okay? Um, so make sure that you recognize that equity does not have any categories. Now we're going to go ahead and look into income. Income slash revenues, whatever you like to address it as. 
Um, so revenues, right? Again, there are, for the sake of this um, sole proprietor, right? There are a couple categories that you would recognize when you're dealing with um, revenues. However, when you go out into the real world, some of these categories, they have interchangeable titles, okay? But in this class, I want you to understand that when you're dealing with revenues, you have you have your operating revenues, and then you have your non-operating or other or other income, okay? Now I call it non-operating income because essentially it's it's not you're receiving money that isn't your core part of your business. All right, so non-operating income slash other income are typically interchangeable. But for this class, we learn it as other income. And I believe in QuickBooks, you learn it as also other income. But for the sake, for this, we're going to only understand, we're only going to categorize sales and other income. And that's it. <laughs> so there's only two categories, operating and other. And then when we move on to um, expenses, right? Expenses is going to have two. It's also two categories, but I call it as three. It's going to be, number one is going to be your cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold is going to be a separate expense. So that deals with when you are directly selling a product, Okay. It's going to associate for the cost that you it takes to sell that product. Operating expenses is going to be anything that has anything that um, runs your business, such as rent. Okay, rent expense. Right, you need to have a facility in order to sell your products. Um, advertising expense. Right, that's another example. Purchase expense. Right, you need to make purchases for to to maintain your business. So those are considered operating um, expenses. Now, in this class, you only learn two. You, are, you guys are only going to learn cost of goods sold and operating expenses. But I do, I, I do want you to um, know this as well, that there is also other expenses or what I call non-operating expenses, right? So I'll give you an example of it, but it's not something that you're not, you're not, um, it's not something that you're being tested on. If you have a non-operating expense, that can be if, for example, I have a warehouse on the east, the east side of Las Vegas, right? That warehouse is going to store all my inventory. It needs to have climate control. It needs to have X, Y, Z, right? It needs to have security. All of those are going are in in a, in, a, in a sense is you're renting a warehouse. So therefore, you need to pay um, a warehouse expense. But that has nothing to do with the core business of your business, of your actual business. This You're not paying rent for the store that you're operating, right? It's considered non-operating because it's not one, it's not on the land that you're actually doing business for, and it's a separate cost. But it does, it is related to the business However, it's not your core fund, uh, your core operating. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Would you say it's, it's an indirect expense? Yes, and um, I've also heard about that too. However, that's more geared towards um, cost accounting, um, especially when you're dealing with direct labor and indirect labor. Yes, so um, it they they do. It's fundamentally similar. It is an indirect cost. However, you're not going to apply this indirect cost for your for your um, sales. Okay, it's not going to be. I have a question. Yes. Yes, uh, under operating revenues, uh, the sales discounts are there. Uh, giving a discount to a sale is it a expense or a revenue? Okay, so. Um, sales discounts, right? Sales discounts is actually going to be a contra account to sales. 
So um, I can see why you think it's an expense. However, it's not an expense. It's just um, another category so that when you sell your items, you don't sell it at full price, right? You sell it at a discounted amount. Now, obviously, this discount doesn't hurt you because you're going to sell your product for a higher value, right? It's going to be at least above how much you originally purchased it for. So in a sense, this is not you um, expensing the item. It's you just decreasing the amount of profit you would actually receive. So it's decreasing the amount of income is that, that it's actually coming into the company. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, I have here a story that once sent to the non operating expenses. I mean, I, I just point of clarification because with the non operating expenses, although you have this particular that example you have indicated, but you're still paying a rent out of that. Um, you, okay, so again, yes, you can have multiple rent expenses, right? But for operating, right, if I were a physical store, let's say I'm located on Rainbow Rainbow and Lake Mead. I have a physical store that's actually going to sell my items. That is going to be your primary rent expense. Okay. Now, let's say um, my, my store is only, it's really small. It's, it's not even a really big store. Like, I can only hold so much stuff. I have to go rent um, a warehouse or a, um, a little facility on Decatur or something like that. I have to go get a storage unit to store the rest of my stuff, and I need climate control. That is going to be something I'm paying for, but that has nothing to do with my business per se. Why? Because it's just a place I'm holding my inventory for. Is my main core of my operation to hold inventory? No, because I'm just, I'm in the process of selling my inventory. Does that make any clear sense? Okay, and so um, you can call that as a rent expense, but um, for, I guess, more meaningful terms would be storage expense, storage unit expense, warehouse expense. It's going, it's, Lynn, yes. May I just real quick, if you don't mind. So I've, I've, I've found a website called accountingcoach.com. And just for clarification, um, it says non-operating expense definition, an expense outside of a company's main operating activities of buying and selling merchandise or providing a service. Correct. So is it, is, is, it's almost like an extension of? Yes, yes, okay. yes. So, I mean, let me, let me give you a, a, a clearer example. Walmart. Walmart, they have, a, they have an actual store, right? All, when you walk in, the inventory that's the inventory that's on the shelves is their main core of operations, right? They're they're trying to sell the product to you, so they need to pay rent expense because they need to keep the store open. Now Walmart has a million shipments every single day, so they need to rent out a plot of land to hold all that inventory. They are not going to put it on the shelves just yet. So oftentimes they ha they call it trailers. It's behind Walmart. But essentially, they need to pay separate fees to hold their inventory. And again, the main operating uh, the main operations of Walmart is not to hold inventory. It's to sell inventory. So um, that's why that's considered non-operating expense. However, when you do a non-operating expense, it, if you decide to buy too much shipment of inventory, are you going to charge an additional fee for that? No, that was your fault. You bought too much inventory. You should have just bought enough. So that's why it's considered non-operating and it's not included in the cost of goods sold. 
okay? Because it's completely separate from your main core of your business, right? Is that a, is that, mm -hmm. What do you mean by liquid? Not, not liquid. In other words, it's, it's just like when you, in the future, you, we are still in the pouring, things like that. Until you get it, you take it out. Yes. Yes. Then it will be on the... On yes. The exactly. Exactly. So, um, yes. So, yes. So, um, yes. So, non-operating... Right, it's anything that has is is any expense. So that's why I use the um, warehouse as an example because um, you know often people people don't know about this as often. Like you're you're the reason why I teach it because Mr. Sanchez does not teach this. I teach it because if you're gonna go out in a real business and you're going to buy um, a little store and you're buying. Um, inventory now your store may be too small to hold all your inventory so there would be a possibility that you may need to um rent out a storage unit to hold your inventory and that is exactly where that cost would go because it's not the main operating um part of your business your business is to sell items not to store it but because you bought too much inventory um, so you can have it readily available, you need to create a, another expense to pay for something else that isn't your main core of your business. So for example, you're, you don't, you, you're, you're not going to sell your items out of your warehouse. Okay? Yes? So we, uh, just for those, for a real life example, um, we, you know, you need, you need to be able to separate that and not include it as part of your operating, um, expenses. Okay. All right. So now we're going to talk about the accounting model. All right. So this is what I was talking about and this is what I want you guys to know. And this is definitely going to be something that you need to know for the exam. Um, I've also have this available to you on the classroom website um, in the chapters one through four, just because um, if it's like, uh, especially if you're not used to journalizing, this would definitely help you in a sense of how to understand the flow of transactions, but also how to journalize as well. Okay. So I have a separate sheet in um, the um in the in the work in the uh, classwork area, so every single type of um, account has a, some kind of flow um, to. So we call this the normal balance. Now, the normal balance is is going to be the positive, um, the positive balance in a type of account. Okay, so for example, assets, right? Assets are usually um, increased or normally would have a debit balance, okay? So when we're, when we're receiving money, right, we're increasing our assets. We're increasing our cash value. So therefore, we need to use a debit to increase our assets. Now, if you pay money, let's say you wrote a check out, right? you're decreasing your assets because you're getting rid of your money, right? Essentially, you're spending your money. So what's going to happen is in order to translate that, you're going to decrease it with a credit, okay? And that also goes in along the lines with debits and credits are not increased and decreased because if you look at, at, if you look at it in a um, liabilities perspective, debits actually decrease the account. And um, credits increase the account. So when you owe, let's say I, um, I bought merchandise from a vendor, right? I owe money because I'm not going to pay him yet. I owe more money, so I'm going to increase it by using a credit. And let's say I pay that bill. 
I'm going to decrease that bill using a debit. Okay, so assets and expenses generally flow in the same direction. They normally are increased with debits and they are decreased with credits. Your other three, which are your revenues, liabilities, and equity, they are, those three are usually increased with a credit and decreased with a debit, okay? And um, you're definitely going to apply this every time you, tr you, you record a transaction, okay? You need to understand first what is the transaction at hand, okay? I am paying a bill, all right? If I'm paying a bill, therefore, I'm decreasing an asset and I'm decreasing a liability. So how you would transform that is I would, I would credit my cash because I'm getting rid of my cash. I no longer have that cash. I would credit my cash and I would debit my um, um, liabilities because I'm decreasing the amount that I owe. All right. Now, this will all make a lot more sense when we actually move on to chapter three, where we understand how to um, to journalize our transactions. But generally, the rule of thumb is this is how um, the accounting model is, is this is what normally should happen. Of course, every time we sell a product, we increase our cash, but we are also decreasing our inventory because we sold the product. It's gone. Okay, and same thing when it comes to equity, right? If you increase equity by reinvesting the profits into equity, then you are essentially you're increasing equity with a credit. Okay, so um, this is definitely something you definitely want to keep, um, especially when we're going to be looking into chapter three. So now if you just need a quick memorization, just think of it this way. Assets and expenses are always increased with a debit. All the other ones are increased by credits. That's it. <laughs> as far as trying to memorize this concept, all right? Now, what we're going to do is for chapter two is we're going to look at a bunch of accounts that you would normally see in um in uh, accounting and you guys are gonna you guys are gonna work together to determine what kind of asset it is so the asset type I'm sorry what kind of account type it is and then you're gonna determine well what is the category and what is the normal balance it would typically have okay and then bookkeeping systems okay so we're almost done here so bookkeeping system is going to entail. Um, so when we're moving in, when we're looking in accounting, right? Um, before we dive into the journal, you need to understand how um, the accounting system is going to be. There is a single um, entry and there's a double entry. Now, make sure you use entry together. Don't call it single and double. Call it single entry and double entry. Now, what a single entry does is if um, it's, it's basically a, a systematic way to record your transaction, right? If I go to the bank, if I go to the bank and I deposit money, right? The only, the only one-way transaction is I'm placing my money and I'm putting it into the bank and I get a deposit slip. That is a one form of transaction right there because all I'm recording is I deposited money. I've only increased my assets. Now, um, that is a one-way transaction, okay? Whereas if I look at on the double entry, the double entry is going to allow me to record the transaction in two different places. Now, don't confuse this as like, oh, I recorded, I made a bank deposit. Um, 
in one book and then I put it in another book. That's not considered double entry. That's you just recording it in multiple places. Yes. But that's not the concept. So the concept in here is when we're understanding the single entry, you only have one direction in flow of transaction. Meaning you only see one thing that you've done. Okay? And what the difference between that and a double entry is, when you're looking at double entry, you're recording the same transaction, but you're involving one or two or more than one account at the same time. So for example, I recorded that I did a bank deposit, right? Actually, scratch that. Um, I, no, let, yeah, let's, let's do that and then I'll do the second example. I recorded a bank deposit, right? So that means I increased my cash value. Oops, sorry. I increased my cash value, right? And my only resource for that is I have a deposit slip. Now, the difference between the double entry is I would have to actually say, well, I no longer have cash on hand. Instead, I made a deposit. So you're going to record the deposit as an increase, or if in other case we use checking, our checking account, I increase my checking account, but I decreased the uh, available cash on hand. Okay, so that's considered a double entry. I'm gonna give you another example. When you write a check, okay? When you write a check, single entry would be, you just record it in your checkbook. Right? That is single entry. I recorded that I wrote a check. In double entry is, I'm going to record that I wrote a check, but I'm also going to decrease my checking account because I wrote a check out, meaning I don't have that money anymore. Okay? So I'm going to write a check so that means i'm gonna i'm gonna record that i wrote a check and i'm gonna record that i'm gonna be decreasing my um uh, my available money my checking account all right does that make sense and um to add to writing that check out is who am i writing that check out am i paying a bill am i paying for an expense am i buying something so you need to have both ends of the transaction. So if I'm writing a check, what is the reason why I'm writing the check for? I need to decrease my, my checking because I'm writing a check. But where is this money going to? Oh, it's going to pay a bill. Okay, so that means I'm going to decrease my accounts payable. Whereas my single entry only recorded that I wrote a check. Okay? And for this class, we are going to utilize the double entry why because gap says so okay um gap does not allow us to do single entry however when we move into quickbooks you will be using um single entry um but for this class we will be looking at double entry um and rule of thumb is all your debits must match all of your credits so if I'm going to write a check for $100 to decrease my cash value by $100, that means I need to also either increase or decrease, whether it's a liability or um, an asset, by exactly $100. And it has to be an equal debit, okay? Because I'm decreasing my cash value, meaning I'm crediting my account. I need to have an equal and opposite um, flow of where my cash is going okay all right and then chapter review again we went over what accounting is we went over the accounting equation which is your assets equals liabilities um, plus your equity we looked at the normal balance of each um, of each one we understand that left and right um, means um, debit and credit we understand that there are five types of accounts which is your assets liabilities equity, revenues, and um, expenses. And we also got to see the categories of each one. So again, assets only have 
um, three categories, right? Um, current, um, fixed, and um, other. Liabilities only have two types, two um, kinds, two, two categories, current and long-term. Equity, no um, categories. However, things that you would normally see that increase and decrease, um, um, equity would be capital contributions and um, uh, um, what was it? Uh, uh, owner's withdrawal. Or, in other words, retained earnings for corporates. Um, and then, again, our temporary accounts are going to be our income or revenue, whatever you want to address it as. And typically, we would see operating income um, or other income, which is the same thing as non-operating. And typically, you would see sales there. Okay? And then, lastly, is going to be um, our expenses. So, there are, you guys only learn two, but there are actually, in reality, there's three. So you have cost of goods sold, operating expense, and um, non-operating expense or other expenses, okay? And that is it for chapter two.